Before I forget, I, I brought a small selection of books that are on these low tables down at the front. And I was thinking yesterday afternoon, oh, I, I go to Manor Road all the time. They've all seen the books. I've got no new books. So I just brought a small box and they're almost all gone. So feel free to you know, finish those off so that I have that little bit less weight in the car on the, the journey home. Uh, maybe that will save some fuel or something. Um, there's, there's no prices on them. If you're able to give something for them, that's super helpful. And I can buy more stock and do it again. Kind of simple. I, I think I had a, a fairly positive childhood. Uh, I know not everybody did, and I'm really thankful for the childhood I had. But maybe you can relate to, to this. There was one point in my day where I did kind of feel fear. It was when the lights were off and I was supposed to be asleep, but I wasn't yet. And it's a weird thing, isn't it? When you're a child, your imagination is on overdrive and the lights are off, even with no cause for concern, you kind of come up with them, don't you? Now, bizarrely, I, in the bedroom that I grew up in, there was a, a shower. I don't know why, I never used it. But there was this shower, and I know there was a dead bird in it. So you'd think that would be the source of nightmares. Never bothered me. Never opened it, but never bothered me. I was never bothered by kind of the light shining and, you know, or, or sort of shadow being cast. You know, like a dressing gown can become a monster in the dark, can't it? The thing that bothered me, I like to sleep with my hands under the pillow, always have, and somehow going over the end of the mattress and down. Ooh, that was terrifying. <laughs> Like at night, that was just an infested nest of dusty spiders and deadly creatures. So I would never let my hands go over the edge of the mattress. Maybe you can relate, or am I totally weird, or both? <laughs> um, it's funny because during the day, I knew there were no spiders there. It was, for a boy's bedroom, it was relatively clean. Uh, I'm not going to say there was no dust, but there was certainly no spiders, and it was fine. But when the lights were off, no thank you. It's funny, isn't it? Because when you grow up, you don't have that same kind of thing. I, you may still be scared of spiders, and that's fine, but it's like childhood fears sort of change. Actually, thinking about it, it it's almost backwards. There's like a, a reversal that goes on. As a child, you tend to be scared of shadows in your bedroom, but completely naive about the world outside. You know, that's why parents tend to lock doors. It's not just to keep people out, it's to keep children in, right? Because children are naive. They, three, four years old, they'll trust any adult. They'll go along with anything, and that's why you hold them close. Then as you grow up, instead of being scared within the shadows of bedtime and, you know, really kind of confident in the world, as you grow up, you realize your bedroom, hopefully, is a safe place. But you also realize that the world isn't. All right, and so how do we cope with that? How do we cope with a, a really dark world? The, the older you get, the more you learn, the more you discover how dark it is, right? Uh, I think we, we tend to cope with that either by trying to stay as naive as possible, and sort of retain that childhood innocence in any area that we can. If I don't know, it doesn't bother me. Or we just distract ourselves. Just keep busy with what's you know, needing to be done and work and what's right in front of us so that we don't have to think about the stuff that may be happening that's quite sinister. Crime type stuff, uh, behind the scenes type stuff, agendas type stuff. The more you look, the more you discover what an incredibly dark world it is. Jesus made a claim in John chapter 8, a really bold claim that has resonated down through the past 2,000 years, and I want you to hear his claim today. It's John 8, verse 12. Let me read it to you. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's a really bold statement. As a child, it sounded like a kind of vaguely interesting one. As an adult, I look at that and think, really? Light of the world not walk in darkness, have the light of life. Is Jesus really able to say that? Is it really true? Now, the, the setting for this, just a little bit of background, there was a, a festival that happened every year for the Jews in the autumn, about this time of year. And so Jews that were 
uh, within a certain range would come and travel to Jerusalem and for seven days they would enjoy food and hanging out with each other. It was kind of a, a sort of a religious party. That sounds like a two words that don't go together, but it really was. It was a really happy time. They would enjoy it. They would eat. They would sit out on their verandas, you know, under these little temporary booths that they made and they would just celebrate God and celebrate each other. And it was a happy, happy time. And so because it was the Feast of Booths, they would have these booths and they wouldn't sort of retreat into their homes. They would sit on the roof or out in the yard, wherever it was, and they would enjoy the warm evenings. I don't want to make you feel jealous. You chose to live here, unless you're under 18, then someone else chose to live here. You know, we're not really relating too well, are we, to a a Jerusalem evening at the moment but for them it was balmy it was warm and they'd sit outside and because it was October it would get dark and so as part of this festival kind of routine that they had in Jerusalem every year they would erect these four huge pillars within the temple courts uh, sort of like candlesticks but don't think flickering flame effectively it's sort of a bonfire on the top of each one of these things so like giant candles they would have to be huge to be seen and they would cast light across the whole city and so this was kind of the setting for jesus to speak to the crowd and make this really bold statement i am the light of the world that's you know, a light, that would be more reasonable, right? I am somewhat lighty, <laughs> you know, among the many lights that are out there, I'm one of them. That's not what he said. <clears throat> he said, I am the light of the world. And so it's a declaration, but it's also an invitation, right? It's an invitation because he says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's a declaration. It's an invitation. Actually, it's a promise. You see, he's not just saying something for us to hear. He's saying something for us to respond to. And so the question is, are we following him? Because whoever follows <coughs> Jesus will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I want to take that sentence, that verse, and look at three elements of it using the verses that follow okay so this whole section we'll just kind of dip in and, and pull a few thoughts from it so first of all we'll not walk in darkness I, I started by saying the world's a dark place and i would think that we're all familiar enough with the world to know that right that there's bad motives there's a lot of people that should not be trusted right it's not a safe place for naive people to just go along thinking that everything is rosy on this planet. It really isn't. But do we realize the extent of that darkness? Jesus was speaking to this crowd here, and for the rest of this paragraph from verse 13 down to verse 20, in effect, he's kind of shining a light on the darkness they're in. Let me read a little bit of it to you. Verse 13, so the Pharisees, that's some religious leaders, said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. That's kind of a legal point. They're saying, you're the only one saying this. Things are supposed to be confirmed by two witnesses. So this isn't true. And Jesus responds, verse 14, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. He, he makes these kind of statements all the time. Sometimes they're a bit perplexing, almost kind of cryptic. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. What does he mean? It's, it's almost to sort of draw them in to go, who is this man? Where does, where does he come from? Where, where is he going? What, what, what is he talking about? But then he says, you do not know where I come from or where I am going. That's the darkness. It's the darkness of, what should we call it, uninformed ignorance, but without care. You see, if you follow Jesus enough, if you read through John's Gospel, uh, even for just a page or two, if you're really looking, you'll start to realize there's something about him that's different. There's something about this Jesus that 
is kind of intriguing. Maybe there's a reason that all across the world in buildings like this and buildings 50 times the size and buildings one-tenth the size, there are people gathering and worshiping this Jesus 2,000 years later. There's something about him that seems to capture people. There's something about him that seems to be different from any other teacher, any other kind of celebrity that the world has ever known. And Jesus here is speaking to the religious leaders and he says to them, you don't know where I've come from, you don't know where I'm going. Essentially, you're uninformed and you don't care. It doesn't bother you, you're just dismissing me. I wonder if that could be a charge leveled at us. Uninformed, don't really know about this Jesus, don't really care. Well, if that's darkness, that's a dangerous place to be. Verse 15, he says, uh, you judge according to the flesh. What does he mean by that? He means you evaluate based on what you can see, what's happening around you. And so you have this kind of uninformed evaluation with arrogance. You think you understand everything. Have you ever been in conversation with an expert about anything? You think you, you know, you've got a, a hobby or an interest, you, you, know, you, you sort of think you know a thing or two about it, and then you talk to somebody that really knows their stuff. It's quite, quite humbling. You know, you've read a couple of you know, what to do when you're not feeling well books, and then you talk to a surgeon. Ooh, if they kind of you know, reveal what they know, you know you don't know much, right? Maybe you've driven a little bit around the streets of Guildford, which is okay, you know, worst places to drive. And then you, you have a chat with Lewis Hamilton about driving. He probably would say things that would blow your mind. Like, well, I had no idea. It could be so complex, so involved. I didn't know that was possible. Any area of expertise that you could choose, if you speak to someone that knows more than you, it's quite humbling, isn't it? And Jesus is saying to these guys, look, you judge according to the flesh, implicitly, and you're confident in your judgment. You think you know everything. You think you know all that there is to know, or all that's needed to know, at least. Most people know they don't know everything, but most people think they know everything they need. But actually, they could be completely uninformed. And that position of confidence could be complete arrogance. I think that's kind of what Jesus is pointing at here. He's saying, you're walking in darkness. You think you know what's going on. You think you know who I am. You think you can evaluate and make a decision. The reality is you're in darkness and you'd be better off humbling yourself and asking questions. You'd be better off humbling yourself and trying to find out more rather than arrogantly dismissing and walking away from the person who is the light of the world, who is offering the light of life in the midst of darkness. Even later in the, the paragraph, in verse uh, eight, sorry, 19, they said to him, where's your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. You see, he keeps on pointing out to them, you do not know what you need to know, and you do not know as much as you think you know, and you certainly don't know as much as you need to know to make a decision. You're in darkness. And I tell you what, I kind of feel like that's still true today. It's so easy, isn't it, to turn on the TV, get a little bit of information and think we know everything there is to know about a subject. All we need to do is speak to an expert and be humbled and then think, okay, if that's true with driving or with scientific you know, laboratory research, or if that's true with surgery, or if that's true with, you name the subject of interest. If that's true with that, then what's true with life? Do I know enough to know or am I actually still in the darkness? Am I actually groping around in the dark, arrogantly thinking that I know how to find life, and actually my experience is that nothing satisfies, that nothing works, and that I'm ultimately going to bed empty at night? Jesus said, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness, but you'll have the light of life. You see, if you'll follow me. Jesus knew where he was going. And in fact, Jesus is the one that can lead us out of darkness into light. Look at verse 21. 
So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. Kind of cryptic, isn't it? He says, I'm going somewhere, and you can't go there. And their best guess is he's going to commit suicide, which he isn't. They're in the darkness. They're guessing and they're getting it wrong. But Jesus knows where he's going. He knows where he's come from. It's, there's this thing about Jesus. When you watch him and kind of see him on the page, you kind of go, it's weird. With, with Jesus, it's like he, he's got this, I don't quite belong here kind of vibe. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, it's, it's like, a foreigner, when they first arrive in a place, they don't quite feel at home. And some, you know, it's a little bit awkward. It's almost like Jesus has got that with this planet. Like he's not, he's not one of us in that sense. Like it's, he's come from somewhere and he keeps talking about where I come from. And they're like, well, show us on a map. Where'd you come from? And yet at the same time, he also speaks about where he's going. And he talks about going to the Father. He's got this incredible familiarity with heaven. Now, normally, when somebody's kind of like a, a religious leader, speaker type, they'll give sort of mystic sort of hints, you know, like, well, if you knew what I knew, and you go, well, what do you know? Uh, not, nothing much. Or they want to give the vibe of being spiritual. With Jesus, it's like he knew heaven like the back of his hand. He was familiar with the Father, like, you know, you're familiar with your closest friend. Better. Like, he, his connection to God is incredible. And as people are watching that, they're going, well, what is this? He seems to not be from here. He seems to know where he's going. He's got this real confidence. What is it about this Jesus? In verse 24, he tells them not only does he know where he is and where he's going, he knows where they're going. And this is really important. He said, I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. What does that mean? That feels a bit jarring, doesn't it? Yes. Unless you believe something about Jesus, it's going to affect your death status. Oof. That feels heavy. What he actually says there is really jarring. It doesn't really come through in the English, but, but what he, he said, what's written there, is unless you believe that I am, now, if you've read the Old Testament, if you've been around the Bible a few times, you, you'll know that I am is quite a woo statement. It's kind of like a, a, a flag for, he's, this is the God of the Old Testament. This is the God who created everything. The I am is the ultimate. When Moses was speaking with God back in the Exodus, and he said, who shall I say sent me to Pharaoh to say, let my people go? God said, say, I am sent you. And here's Jesus making bold statements like, Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Wow. This is no kind of mild, gentle comment, is it? This is not just a throwaway line. This is a, did you just hear that? Like this is, people would talk about this for ages after hearing that. I can't believe the boldness of the man to, to say something like that. Who would say such a thing? Well, the issue is, is it true? Because if it's true, then it's exactly the right thing for him to say, because Jesus is not just a man making claims. Fully human, he's also fully God. The God who created everything was stood right in front of them. And he's saying to them, look, I know where I've come from. I know where I'm going. I've got a relationship with my father. I know heaven. You know, you want directions. I can tell you where to turn left in heaven. Like, he knows all of that stuff, but he also knows where they're going. In their darkness... If they carry on in their darkness, if they don't follow him, if they don't accept the light that gives life in the darkness, then they will die in their sins. And the emptiness of this life, the fall short of expectationsness of this life that we experience because of sin, because it's broken, because things are not right, because of the darkness that's out there and also because of the darkness that's in here, Jesus is saying, unless you follow me, that's your forever state. Groping around in the dark, 
thinking there must be something else. It's really heavy, isn't it? Really serious. But it's really serious because it's really important and true. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We've thought about walking in darkness, verses 13 to 20. We've thought about whoever follows me, verses 21 to 24. He is the one that is offering a way out. But how? How can he give us the light of life? Look at verse 25. So they said to him, who are you? It's a really important question. Someone's going to make claims like that. Who are you is exactly the right thing to ask. So Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me, that's God the Father, is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So look at verse 28. Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. How can Jesus say that he offers the light of life in a dark world? How does that work? They're, they're struggling. These people here are scratching their heads going, we don't get it. We don't understand what you're saying. We can't, can't get our minds around this. And Jesus says, there's coming a point in time where I'll make it clear. What is it that he says, verse 28? When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Lifted up the Son of Man. Jesus talks about it in John 3, talks about it here in John 8, talks about it again in John 12. In John 12, when he's talking about being lifted up, John the writer helpfully clarifies to us what he means. It doesn't mean lifted up to heaven or anything like that. It means lifted up to die. Jesus said this to speak, to, to make clear by how he was, by which means he was going to die, something like that. Lifted up, it was a phrase they used. What happened to that crazy guy that was, you know, hanging out on the street and robbing people? Oh, the Romans caught him, they lifted him up. Oof. Lifted up meant being stripped naked, beaten and lifted up and nailed to a cross, humiliated as a warning to others. Don't commit the crimes this person has done or this could happen to you. It's kind of the way the Romans kept peace. And if they could keep peace, they could keep taxes. And you know how that stuff works, right? And so the lifting up thing was common language. And Jesus here is talking about the Son of Man himself being lifted up. And he says, when that happens, then you will know that I am. That must have been a head scratcher in John 8. But by the time we get to John 19, and Jesus is literally lifted up on a cross, those with eyes to see look at that and say, wow, that was God's plan. That's God the Son choosing to go to the cross, to be lifted up, to, to demonstrate for us the heart of God. That's amazing. If God is the kind of God who would go through that for the sake of people groping around in the dark like us, if he would be willing to go through what Jesus went through on the cross, then maybe there is hope in this world. I can't find it myself. But maybe that's what Jesus was saying all along. That instead of keeping on trying, keeping on learning, keeping on experimenting, keeping on thinking that the next thing will be the fix that finally satisfies, maybe we need to recognize that he knows what he's talking about. He's the expert. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's quite a claim, but based on who Jesus is, and based on what Jesus has done, it's not a stretch. It makes sense. And if you want to make sense of it, ultimately you need to go to the cross. In your mind, go to the cross and try to wrap your head around the fact that God sent his son and God the son went to the cross 
for you. For the things you've done, the things you've said, the things you've thought, the things you'd wish you could do given the opportunity or if you had the money in the bank, the things that you wish you could say, the things that you would do if you could get away with it, all of it, all of the darkness that's in us, Jesus shone the light of life into that. He was made sin for us. He died on the cross in our place. And until the cross, it doesn't make sense. How can he be the light of the world? And how can he offer the light of life? It seems extravagant. And then you come to the cross and you see what he went through. You go, wow. That's his identity. That's his authenticity. That's the reality of who he is. In a dark world, and it's darker than any of us realize, in a dark world, would it change something if, you're, if you were to discover that the true God, the God who is over it all, the God who created it all, the God who one day will judge it all, would it change anything if you discovered that that God looks exactly like Jesus, willing to suffer and hang naked, shamed and humiliated on a cross for you. Spend some time at the cross. Ponder what you see there. Allow it to shine a light into your life. And my prayer is that every single one of us will get to the point where we can say, oh yeah, John 8, 12, what's that again? It's when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Oh yeah, that one. I agree. I've got that light in me. The world's still dark, but I'm enjoying the light of life, and I know where I'm going. I'm going exactly where Jesus is. I'm going to be with him. And so let me encourage you, read it through again. Ponder it. Even just take the phrase, I am the light of the world, and you look this week and see how dark this world really is. And in every moment of darkness, remind yourself, no, Jesus is the light of the world. And ask yourself, do I have the light of life in me? Is that the reality that has gripped me? And the best place to go for that is to the cross. Because when the Son of Man is lifted up, then you can know that I am. That that is God. That is what God is like, and that's what God has done for us. Amen. Amen. Amen.